John Barnett here, welcoming you to the 52 greatest chapters in the Bible. Uh, as you see on that picture there, we're on week 10, and uh, we're covering Job 1 and 2, but the theme today may be one of the most exciting I've ever covered in all the weeks so far with you, and that is what I call the invisible war. Now let me explain to you what I mean by the invisible war. Up here on the marker board, I put week 10, uh, Job 1 and 2, vis Invisible War. Now notice this underheading, God Explains. Now, remember, we're studying through these chapters to get a, an overview of the whole Bible. And that's why we're jumping, kind of hopscotching between them, going from Genesis to Revelation. But in Job 1 and 2, we have the most clearly defined example of this invisible war. What I'm talking about here is Satan and his demons fighting against God in the realm of humans, in our lives. In other words, God explains what Satan and demons can do to you today. Most people, it's very vague. When they hear about spiritual warfare, when they hear about, you know, we need to wear our armor, it's kind of like, what does that mean? I'm not involved in that. I mean, I just go to work and, you know, I work out and I, I have my routine. But did you know Satan can affect your mind and your body? He can affect the world around you. In fact, let, let's look at what he can affect. See this line? The bad news is that Satan is watching you. I have a lot of people, they don't like being tracked and they don't want to be on Facebook and, and they're worried about, you know, all the different uh, ways that that surveillance and the government and their medical records, do you know what I mean? It's just many people are afraid of kind of the police state and artificial intelligence and the whole facial recognition. You know what's worse? The bad news is Satan is watching. We're gonna see in Job 1 and 2, or, or in Job 1, 6 through 11, that Satan knows all about us. He watches us, he knows our family, he knows our job, he knows about our health, he knows God's blessing. That's the bad news. The good news is Satan and the demons are limited by God. They are so malignant, they're so evil, so powerful, that they could snuff out all human life on earth. That's how deadly demons are. One demon killed the firstborn of humans and animals in the whole land of Egypt in one night. There's one angel that God let out of the pit that killed 185,000 soldiers in their beds as they slept at night. These things are powerful, but the good news is that God limits them. Thirdly, ominously, Satan and demons can kill, steal, and destroy, John 10, 10. We're talking about not just that's their intent, they can use people to steal, to kill, to destroy. That's what happens in Job, and that's why it's gonna be such a great week studying this with you. Perilous news, Satan and his demons can make violent weather. Satan and his demons make weather so powerful that it knocks down, we'd call it a tornado, and then sickening, Satan and his demons can inflict disease and sickness. And that's why I'm going to all the way through this session remind you of this. Remember the Lord's Prayer, deliver us from the evil one? That's what the Lord wants to do. Well, back to your slides. I have shown you uh, this uh, Reminder that we're on this, the 10th week, Job 1 and 2. And remember, this very chart that you see right here is on our Facebook page. Do you see that address there? It's also available on our website. And you can see that address there, discoverthebook.org. But this, this chart reminds you where we are, week 10. All the other nine weeks uh, prior to this are posted. Uh, not only on this YouTube channel, but they're also posted on Facebook, and they're, they're available on our website. So remember, uh, no matter, you can start, by the way, you can start anywhere. You don't have to go back to week one. You can start with us right now. Uh, you, you can start in week one and just go for 52 weeks. So whatever works best for you. Just, here's what I tell every class, don't discourage yourself. Like some people, they say, I'm going to catch up. I'm nine weeks behind, I'll catch up this week. Don't do that. That's the only thing I'd say don't do. This study, you need a whole week to read the chapters one and two each day. 
to take your notebook. Remember, I've, I've taken the, the sheet that has all of these uh, chapters listed, all 52 of the key chapters. I put it in the front of this notebook. I put the how to study in the front cover. And then I've made a two page spread and I wish I had more because I, I do far more than this and I have to type it into my computer. But I keep it all in this notebook. So don't try and do multiple weeks in one week. Next slide. Um, the invisible war is what every believer needs to know about Satan, demons, and spiritual warfare. Why? Because God explains. See, the book of Job is God explaining exactly what Satan and demons can do, but not vaguely. They can do this to you today. Every believer needs to be aware that there is this what I call a cosmological, invisible war. Well, let's real quickly, before we jump into Job, look at the doctrine of the creation of angels. This in theology, uh, and if you look up for a second, uh, right over here is one of the suggested resources, the, the two resources that I say, if at all possible for you to buy are Wayne Grudem's Systematic Theology. See how big and thick this is? I've taught through this three times with leaders in churches where I've served over the years as pastor. And this, this book gives the conservative, the charismatic, the reformed, the um, covenantal like Lutheran and Roman Catholic view, as well as uh, the author's personal view. And it's, it's a real treasure to see what Christendom has taught about key doctrines over the years. And the other resource is this. This is the MacArthur Study Bible. And of course, I have it open right now to Job, and I check each of his notes. There are 25,000 footnotes in this Bible, and it's a real treasure. But back to uh, the slides. Uh, the doctrine of the creation of angels in systematic theology is called angelology. And here's what the Bible teaches us. God created all the angels, and I believe that was during creation week. And among the angels, two-thirds still obey and serve him, but one-third of all the angels God created rebelled. And of those, some are in prison because they're so malignant, as I said, so bad. Now God lets some of them out from time to time uh, to fulfill his purposes, and especially we're going to see uh, in Revelation 9, I'll write that down here, Revelation 9, uh, that's the prison that Revelation 9 we see opened and God lets these horrific creatures out. But two-thirds of the uh, angels, or I mean it isn't real clear how many of them are in this prison, but most of them, let's say, of the demons, the fallen angels, are not in prison. They're doing bad things here on earth, and that's what this lesson is about. So I could summarize everything the Bible says about angels from cover to cover, Genesis to Revelation, by these words. Angels are supernatural and super powerful creatures. As far as we know, angelic creatures are indestructible. They can't be killed or destroyed. They travel the universe effortlessly. They don't need spaceships. Uh, they seemingly... And again, this is everything the Bible says. Never rest, never sleep. In fact, they don't even need to eat. But let's not spend too long on that because the important thing to know, the big picture is, God is absolutely powerful. And that's why angels are such a good picture of the power of God. Uh, we should fear not, but the Bible tells us over and over, resist the powers of darkness because the battle is already won. Jesus Christ has triumphed. And that would be probably the theme of this entire lesson. Uh, in Job 1 and 2, we see that God the Father and God the Son and God the Spirit have triumphed. And we're more than conquerors through Christ. Here's a, a key passage uh, a little bit later. I'm going to talk about scripture memory. But if you ever uh, would like to be prepared for the onslaught of the kingdom of darkness... The scriptures say, be strong in the Lord 
in the power of his might, not ours. Put on the whole armor of God. That's important. You need to understand it. Each piece is vital that you may be able to stand against, and there's that word, Satan's wiles, his plans. He can attack our minds, our emotions, and our bodies. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Most people's enemies are, you know, other people, things they see. But actually, the real struggle, the invisible war, is against principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this age, spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. People talk about conspiracies. This is the ultimate conspiracy. All the hosts, the fallen hosts of heaven, are arrayed against us. What's the solution? Paul, who has so much experience with spiritual warfare, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, and then he gives the, the, wep, or the armor. Stand therefore, having, having girded your waist with truth, everything in our life bound in by truth. We think the truth, we speak the truth, we study the truth, we live the truth. Put on the breastplate of righteousness. That means that, that I guard my heart and I don't let in things that defile and kind of in this COVID time, we're also aware of germs. Well, some of the most nefarious germs are spiritual falsehoods that can penetrate our mind. Third piece, shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Uh, what that means is we're supposed to strap on the peace of God and walk through life with that peace. And when people see us, they say you're different. And we say, yeah, here's why. Take the shield of faith. By the way, this is the only way to quench the fiery darts of the wicked. Satan is constantly shooting at us. The only way to stop him is believing the truth of God. Take the helmet of salvation. In other words, I call that preaching the gospel to ourself. And here's the only offensive weapon, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So that's an important passage. And that takes us to what I call the extra online resources uh, to deepen your study this week. Uh, there's a whole series you see here at the bottom called Spiritual Warfare, and uh, Lesson 21 is Satan's Fiery Arrows. I go through the spiritual armor. I talk about life being like going on a patrol as an uh, American commando and how we put on our weaponry and or our armaments and weaponry and how to extinguish Satan's arrows. Okay. Real quickly, look up from your slides for a second. I want to run through to give you a perspective as we start diving into the scripture. Uh, the invisible war, the bottom line I said is because we're more than conquerors, we should trust the one seated on the throne. Job opens with this. Look in your Bible, and, and I'm going to read. There was a man in the land of Uz, verse 1, whose name was Job. That man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and shunned evil. By the way, who... who wrote those words? Well, a human author, probably Moses, uh, if you read the background material in the MacArthur Study Bible, he goes through all the possible authorship ideas. Most likely it was Moses, that's what the Jewish people think. And, and as he wrote the Pentateuch, he was also writing the book of Job about a man in, in the distant past who was an example to the children of Israel while they were suffering in the bondage in Egypt. So, but who really wrote these words? Moses might have recorded them. See, inspiration tells us God wrote these. And look, this is God explaining how he looks on us. He looked on this man who lived maybe 5,000 years ago, 4,500 years ago, a long time ago. And he said... He was blameless in God's sight, upright in God's sight. He feared God. What does fear God mean? It means I know that God is watching. And so when someone solicits me to do something or I'm tempted to do something, I say, no, no, I can't do that because God is watching me and I want to please him. I don't want to displease God. That's what fearing God is, to know that God is present He's here. He's listening. He's watching. He, he's making a door of escape. If I need to flee from temptation, he always makes a way of escape. That's what it means to fear God. And look at this. He shunned evil. 
And then he had seven sons and three daughters and his possessions and all of this. But look at verse six. Now there came a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan came with them. The Lord is presented as the one who's seated on the throne. And God the Father is seated on the throne and Satan comes in with the angels. God allows that for his purpose. Now in Revelation 12, remember, Satan is confined to earth and can't do that anymore. And in Revelation 20, he's confined to the pit and can't get out for a thousand years. So God is totally, remember, Satan and the demons are limited, as we saw over here on this board. But this whole, the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, is tr we are to trust the one who's seated on the throne. Why? Because he's in touch with our lives. Look how he knew everything about Job. He knew all his children. He even knew all of the balances in his finances. Uh, look what it says in, in verse 3. His possessions were 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys. That's detail. God limits Satan's attacks. See, this, this is the purpose of the book of Job, for us to trust our Father who's seated on the throne. Now back at the slides, just to get the background. Do you see the book of Job right here? Remember there are two elements we always cover, sacred history. Everything happened sometime, sacred geography. Everything happened somewhere. See where the book of Job is? It's kind of in the, the first half of the book of Genesis. It's before Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, and all these other books. It's way up here. Look at this next slide. I would put it right here, right after the flood and before the time of Abraham. And you say, why? That's because the scriptures tell us uh, about Job's life. And he is a, uh, someone who is just after the flood. He actually saw dinosaurs and, and uh, the Ice Age glaciers. I would also put him right here in this chart. See, between Noah, 2500 B.C., and Abraham, 2000 BC, in that 500 year period. But remember, and if you look up, Job, and you can read about that in the notes here in the MacArthur Study Bible, he saw two creatures alive that we could only describe as dinosaurs. He also saw what he called mountains of ice and frozen like what we would call a frozen sea, like, you know, the, the, the great Arctic Ocean that's frozen. He saw those things. Now, let's talk about geography. If, if you look over here, you can't see it very well, but you know me, I'm a teacher at heart. Uh, this is the Roman Empire. This is Spain, France, Northern Africa, you know, uh, Western Europe and the Balkan area. Here is Turkey. But all this in the brown, you can see the entire ring of the Mediterranean is the old Roman Empire. But biblically, when it says Job was the greatest of the East, you remember everything in the Bible, you always do your directions from Jerusalem. So east of Jerusalem, somewhere in this area, anywhere up here is east. These are all people of the East. So Job was living somewhere here, we would call it, toward what would be uh, Mesopotamia, uh, the Fertile Crescent area right here. He's east of Jerusalem in the desert area, somewhere up there. So that's sacred geography. Back to your slides. Um, so he's right here in history. He is over here somewhere in this eastern area. See, there's Jerusalem, so due east. Uh, out in that area, he is living, and he's one of the greatest uh, of all those who live in the East. Uh, so, I'm just reminding you, each day of this week, I'm reading the passage in my Bible, but I'm checking the background in the study Bible. And that's what I just showed you. Then, I'm recording everything I'm finding. The first thing I do is I, I write out a title. And, and I wrote as my title, uh, The Invisible War. And I summarize these two chapters, Job 1 and 2, as The Invisible War. Then, every time I read it, and I'm reading it every day this week, 
I'm finding as many lessons as possible, and I've found almost 20, and truths and doctrines. And I write them down in my own words. Now remember, this is just for you to grow and learn. And then, of course, I'm studying other resources. But here's the most important part. And every week I remind you, write a prayer in which you ask the Lord to unleash a truth you found or a lesson you found into not your wife, your girlfriend, your husband's life, or your children, or your co-workers. What? Into your life. Into my life. Okay, now this is my journal. And if you look up, here it is. Uh, again, I show you nothing fancy. Remember how I prepare it? I have the index in the front, and then I'm just writing, and, and I'm writing and writing. I have lots of pages that I'm writing. But up here are the title, all these are the lessons, down here is the prayer. Now, since you can't read that, look back at the slides. Here's my journal typed out for you. Week 10, Job 1 and 2, I wrote as my title, Job, God, and Satan, the Invisible War. Then, this is what I sketched out as the summary. There's an unseen battle that swirls. Job and his family are exposed to the amazing cosmological warfare going on between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of darkness. Now, what is the invisible war? And I spent a long time looking, cross-referencing through other parts of the Bible. And you can use your, your MacArthur Study Bible. It, it gives multitudes of, of uh, passages to look at. But look what I wrote. When Paul said, we are not ignorant of his, Satan's devices, he said that here, 2 Corinthians 2.11, he was reminding us what the Bible teaches about the various tools Satan and his demons employ to employ to perform mind games. That's what the Greek word devices or wiles. You know, we're not ignorant of his devices. The Greek word means mind games. It's actually the word for our mind, and it's it's used kind of like we're not, we're not ignorant of what he's doing to our mind. And also that word is in Ephesians 6.11. Now Peter, that's what Paul said uh, up here, but Peter now expands this uh, from our minds to our bodies. And he talks about the ongoing military type of campaign that Satan wages against our body through the gateway of lust. That's 1 Peter 2.11. And the word he uses is stratuantoi, strategy. It's a military campaign. Now look, this is most important. We are sometimes unsure of what Satan and his demons can really do. However, Job 1 and 2 gives us more clear insight from God on what Satan and his demons can do to believers, saints, and spirit-indwelt ones than any other passage in the Bible. And as you saw over here, the bad news is Satan is always watching. It's far worse than the surveillance state we see growing around us with AI, facial recognition, GPS, and vast databases like Clearview. Did you see that this week? Clearview, that's a company. They have scraped Facebook and Google, and they have three billion faces that the facial recognition cameras using AI can identify with your name as you're walking through any city that has those cameras. Isn't that amazing? Worse than that is the super intelligent aliens that are among us unseen, listening, and interfering with both our minds and our bodies. Okay? Now, look up, and I want to go over this seeing you, okay? The bad news is that worse than, than all the cameras that are watching us and, and the GPS and facial recognition that everybody's worried about, and now they're worried about taking the vaccine and, and some kind of chip or something, they're just, everyone is afraid of the physical world. This lesson is to get you concerned about the invisible world. The bad news is Satan is watching and listening. He knows everything about us. Take your Bible and let me just read to you everything. Look what Satan says. Uh, verse 7 of Job 1. And the Lord said to Satan, where do you come from? And Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro on the earth, from walking back and forth on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, verse 8, have you considered my servant Job? There's none like him on the earth. And, and God gives him this great pedigree we've already read. So Satan answered, verse 9, 
and said, does not, or does Job fear God for nothing? Verse 10, look how much he knows the bad news. Have you not made a hedge around him, around his household, and around all that he has on every side? Number one, Satan is aware that God limits him. And he says, I've been probing, kind of like the velociraptors in Jurassic Park. I've been touching the fence and it's been zapping me. I could not get in to him. That's the good news. Wow. God limits Satan. Like I said over here, trust the one seated on the throne. But listen to what Satan knows. Verse 10 continues. Around his household, around all that he has on every side, you've blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased. Satan is aware. That's, that's the bad news. The good news is God limits him. But what we fail to think about is Satan and his demons, what they can do using people, Satan and his demons using the weather, Satan and his demons inflicting disease and sickness. And, and I'm going to conclude our, our session in a, in a little while with one of the greatest applications. Remember the Lord's Prayer? The Lord's Prayer? The Lord's Prayer is addressed to our Father on the throne. And he wants us to pray that he would deliver us from the evil one. So that's really, and if, if you have to tune out now, and I know many of you, uh, I watch on, on YouTube, and, and most people only make it halfway through any of these classes, sadly. So if you have to leave, trust the one seated on the throne who limits the devil, and he is the one who wants you to ask him to deliver you from the evil one. Okay, back to the slides. The bad news is Satan's watching. The good news is that, that God is limiting him. The ominous news is that Satan and his demons can move people to kill other humans, to steal from them, to destroy things of theirs. Jesus taught us Satan's goal is to kill, steal, and destroy, John 10.10. 10. And the account of Job is the clearest and most powerful illustration of this truth. The perilous news is Satan has the ability to stir up, stir up bad and harmful weather that injures and kills humans. We see that in Job 116, 118, and 19. The sickening news is Satan and his demons can cause sickness. Now listen, do you remember how many demon attack ailments were uh, in, in the time of Christ's ministry? The demons attacking people and they had all these ailments? Now do you see why Jesus said in Matthew 6, the Lord's Prayer, we're to be regularly asking God our Father every day to deliver us from the evil one? Here's the lesson. We need to be aware and ask him for him to protect us and not float along oblivious to the invisible war. Okay, here's what I found in my Bible. Here are the lessons. Uh, Job was a godly man. God describes him. Job was wealthy, had a large family, and they were very close. Great, great example of a praying dad. Uh, he went before the Lord on behalf of his kids. Verse 5. Now look at these doctrinal lessons we learn. Satan is an adversary. Now remember, Satan in Hebrew means adversary. Satan can accuse us before God. Look up from your slide for a second. That's something probably that motivates me more than anything else. To know that God the Father is seated on the throne. And the Bible says that Satan can come and look up at God and say, do you see what one of yours, what John Barnett is doing or feeling or thinking today? Because Satan knows those things or his demons. Satan isn't omnipresent. He travels between places. Rarely would I think I've ever had any contact with him. But often I'm very aware of demonic oppression, flaming arrows, and resistance from his demons. But the lesson here is Satan accuses God the Father on the throne and says, that's one of yours. Look what they're doing. Do you remember when David sinned? Do you remember what Samuel 
or I mean, Nathan the prophet told David he did. Nathan says, David, you've caused the enemies of the Lord to rejoice. You've caused those, those demons and Satan who get to come in front of God's throne to remind God of your unfaithfulness and sin. That's a big motivator for me. When I start out my day, I say, Father in heaven, I want to hallow your name today. I want you to rule my life. I, as much as possible, want to look at verse 1 and shun evil. Job 1.1. 1, 1. I, my goal, going through today, with all that I've done, every, everywhere I've been today, I want to shun evil. Big question. Do you? Do you shun evil? Or do you make Satan have lots to point at and accuse you? Now, there's good news. At the right hand of the Father is Jesus Christ, our, our advocate. He is the one who, when Satan comes and, and basically... Here's Satan looking up at God and saying, did you see what your servant, your, your supposed shunner of evil is doing? And as Satan's doing that, Jesus Christ comes and goes, well, I paid for that one. They belong to me. And he intercedes for us. He's our advocate. He is the one, our great high priest, who ever lives to make intercession for us. So it's good. He comes between the accuser and the father. But why not give less for the accuser to accuse us of? See, that's our job. Okay, back to your slides. Satan is an adversary. He wants to accuse us before God. And by the way, if you want to study this, Hebrews 7, 24 and 25 talks about Jesus ever living to intercede for us. But look at the doctrine here. Satan is mobile. He's not omnipresent. Uh, Satan has uh, this hedge that stops him, so he's not omnipotent. And Satan thinks Job would abandon God, so he's not omniscient. So see, Satan's not omnipresent. He's not omnipotent. He's not omniscient. And God always limits his attacks. Um, and this is something neat, this hedge. We can pray, Lord, thank you for protecting, deliver me. That's what the Lord's Prayer is. Deliver us from evil is asking for that hedge. Okay, whoop, back up, sorry. Number 10, this is the 10th observation I found in chapters 1 and 2. Satan can move people and armies to harm other people. That's in verse 15. Look what it says in verse 16. Satan can call down fire from heaven. He can send what we would call lightning and fire from above. He can send tornadoes. Wow. Every time it's tornado season, I pray that the Lord protect people I know and ministries I know uh, because we don't want the evil one and all of his rampages to, to hurt and we want the Lord to limit as he promised. Now look at this. In all this horrible time, Job bowed before God as sovereign Lord and actually says, look at verse 20 in your Bible. It says, and Job rose, tore his robes, shaved his head, fell to the ground and worship. And look at number 14, verse 21. That's the, the Job's affirmation that God is good all the time. But in spiritual warfare, like Job faced, Wealth, character, and godliness do not prevent Satan's attack. So some people think, oh, if I'm wealthy, godly character, and all that, that Satan won't attack me. No, Job was all those, and Satan still attacked him, but he had to trust God's limiting power. God was glorified. We already talked about this. Satan can inflict diseases, and boy, is this a big one. Uh, in fact, look, look at verse 10, and let's talk about this for a second. Chapter 2 in your Bible, um, and verse 10. And this is really important for all of us. This is one of those times you ought to stop and think about this. You ought to mark this verse, circle it, highlight it. So Job says to his wife, in verse 9, she said to him, Do you still hold fast, curse God, and die? 
Verse 10, But he, Job, said to her, his wife, You speak as one of the foolish women speak. He said that, in other words, that's a polite way of saying, that wasn't a good idea, Mrs. Job. Shall we indeed accept good from God? Now, wait a minute. How many of us, every time something good happens, every time we feel healthy, every time we recover from an illness, every time we excel in, in sports or our jobs or in academics, we go, oh, Lord, thank you for that. Thank you for that blessing. Thank you for my restored health. Thank you for my promotion. Thank you for, you know, answering my prayer and uh, giving me this wonderful wife. We really are, are into thanking God for the good. But look at verse 10. Shall we indeed accept good from the Lord, and shall we not accept adversity? If you really believe, look, look up here. God is in touch with our lives, and God limits Satan's attacks. If God is the omnipotent, omniscient sovereign seated on the throne, then we should thank him for not just the good, but for the bad. In our lives because God uses the bad for us to glorify our Father in heaven because he is better than good health in bad health we say Lord thank you for reminding me I have a, a body in heaven they'll never be sick and and sore and 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 wasted away with cancer thank you that that I have treasures in heaven nobody can steal nobody can take away from me do you see why God even though he limits Satan's attacks, look at this. God allowed Job to lose his property, his kids, and his health. Why? So that chapter 1, look in your Bible, verse 20. So that, so that Job would do verse 20. And Job arose, tore his robe, shaved his head, and fell to the ground in what? Worshipped. When Satan the accuser saw Job fall on his face and say, Verse 21, Satan heard him. Naked came I from my mother's womb. Naked I shall return there. The Lord gave. The Lord is taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. That was the purest, most powerful worship that could come from one of God's servants that God allowed to lose everything. Are you thanking God for the good and the bad? That's really an important lesson. Back to your slides. Um, so those are the lessons I found. Here's my prayer. And I'm going to pray it right now. Lord, I bow before you as my almighty God, who is enough for anything I'll ever need. So as I suffer, I may glorify you. I want to see I want you to see me living out the sanctifying life of Christ. I want to be upright, fearing you, shunning evil. Help me not to fear a limited devil, but help me to be aware of his power over people, over weather, even my health. I want to bow in worship and not give in to despair or anger when troubles come so that you can see me not charging you with evil when you accomplish your plan. Keep me from anger over any loss of health, wealth, or family, so that I can accept both good and hard times as part of your plan. For Christ's sake, amen. That's my prayer right here. I want to show you something. The word El Shaddai occurs most frequently in all the Bible, right here in the book of Job. And what El Shaddai, El Shaddai means is the God who is enough. Now, look up and think about it. God is the God who is enough. When we are facing Satan's killing, stealing, destroying, when we're seeing all the violent things he can do in the world around us, when we're inflicted with disease and sickness, when we see God allowing us to lose things like our wealth and our family and even our personal health, what the Lord wants us to know is he hears our cries. He heard Job saying, the Lord gave and the Lord took away. I accept the good. I accept the bad. 
I will blessed, bless the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Back to your slides. We're, we've got to finish up this lesson. What does the Lord want us to do? He wants us to trust the one seated on the throne. That's the message of the book of Job. Our Father on the throne stays in touch with our lives. That's what it says in Job 1, 1 to 5. He knows our children, our family. He knows our finances. He knows our responsibilities. He knows our reputation. All of these things. And what's the lesson? God was tracking with everything going on in Job's life. Number two, our Father on the throne regulates the adversary Satan. And, and the truth for us is God prompted the devil's attacks against Job. That's all that we can say, the Bible says. In verses 9 to 12, Satan wants to make God's servants dishonor their king on the throne. Remember David's sin caused the enemies of the Lord to rejoice? I already told you that. That's what grieves our God when we willfully sin against his grace offered in time of need. Job doesn't do that. Next slide. Our father on the throne allowed Job to lose his property and his children. Satan can incite terrorists to rob and kill. Uh, Satan can send down fire like lightning from the sky. In fact, in Revelation 13, we see that happening in the tribulation. And in Job 1.17, Satan can send tornadoes and deadly weather. So all of this was allowed by God. Uh, number four, I love this. Our Father in heaven on the throne listens to the cries of our hearts. This is what God heard. Job arose, tore his robe, shaved his head, fell on the ground, worshipped. By the way, that, you know what that word worship means? The Greek word translating this Hebrew word is pros, kuneo. You know what that means? That, that Job fell on his face and kissed toward the Lord and said, Naked I came from my mother's womb. Naked I will return. The Lord gave and is taken away, and I'm going to bless his name. God was magnified by the cries of Job's heart. Number five, our father on the throne allowed Job to suffer intensely bad times. Bottom line, God allowed Job to suffer. What's the lesson? Bad things can happen to good people in order for them to glorify God. If you really want to glorify God, let him put you in jail like Paul. Let him have you beaten like Paul. Uh, be like Job and lose everything and still bless the Lord. Now here's the big closing lesson. Number six, pray to the one seated on the throne. And now this is when I want to show you this resource. This resource is on our Facebook page. This resource is also on our website. Uh, these actually are two sides. This is the front and this is the back of a card that fits right in. It's actually a credit card size card and you can um, download it, print it off and put it in your wallet. And what it does is it takes the Lord's Prayer in Matthew 6 and it has the words of the Lord's Prayer. See all the way through here. And then it has the application. Our, in this manner, therefore, pray our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. What is that Jesus telling us to do? I need to ask the Lord to focus me on who you are as God, that you are the one seated on the throne. Control me. Your kingdom come. You have a plan for my life. Instead of me trying to figure everything out, control me. I surrender to you. Lead me day by day, step by step, so I do your will. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Supply me. See, we can't make it unless the Lord gives us what we need for every day. Why is that so important? So I can see your hand in my life. Cleanse me so I keep your blessing on my life. Forgive us of our debts as we forgive our debtors. My sins and iniquities separate me from the Lord. I have to ask for his cleansing. Now here's the key from Job. Protect me and do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Protect me so I don't lose your power in my life. I want to hold up that shield of faith, the sword of the spirit. And then I love this ending. It says in the end of chapter, thir or chapter 6, verse 13, For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever, 
Do you know what that lesson is? Empty me so you'll get all the credit in my life. Keep going. That's the invisible war. God explains what Satan and the demons can do to you today. This next slide reminds you of the profit and power of Bible study. Your words are found. That's when you take time to read and study. I ate them. That's when you find truths and start thinking about them and actually making them into the prayer. Your word was to me the joy and rejoicing in my heart. That's when we ask God to work those things in us by his grace. And look at the bottom line, what happens. We grow in this awareness that we belong to the Lord of hosts. By the way, that's, that's the Lord of Sabbath, the Lord of armies, the powerful almighty God. Here are my two challenges I give you every week. Number one, find someone you can share your findings and application prayer with. Number two, start reviewing scriptures and even take the challenge that, that I personally do and I put my verses on the back of my phone. Bonnie and I are uh, your partners in ministry and I would ask you and invite you if you would take time, pray for us. Uh, we're getting ready right now as, as soon as uh, we just have a couple more things to take care of here in this studio and then we're going for another month on the road teaching classes uh, as our prayer card that I flashed in front of you said we equip and mobilize in fact if you look at our card if you want to know how to pray for us we are teaching classes equipping which means training and, and getting back into step and mobilizing that means helping young people get started those who reach the least reach peoples of Asia, Europe, and Africa. Uh, I just finished a, a wonderful session with uh, a group of Commonwealth nations. Those are part of the British Empire. Uh, the first two months of this year, January and February, we were working, teaching in, in uh, small groups and Bible institutes around the Pacific Rim from virtual studios. We're going back for the next month teaching in, in more studios, more classes. Uh, you can pray for me right now. I'm reading the book of Hebrews through every day. I've got to teach the book of Hebrews. We're also launching, uh, you can see over here and you can see right here, we're launching the year-long virtual study tour, a devotional study tour through the land of the book. Uh, I'm going to be giving uh, one lesson a week on site right where it happened in the land of the book. So lots for you to pray about. Thank you for joining week 10. And God bless you this week. As you remember, Job teaches us, trust the one who sits on the throne. Why? Because there is an invisible war. And God warns us what Satan can do, but says we can ask him to deliver us from the evil one. Let's close in a word of prayer. Father, thank you for each one who came to this class. Thank you for the power of your word. I pray that you'd bless them this week. Going through Job 1 and 2 every day this week, uh, studying, reading, but most of all, learning to trust you. You're seated on the throne, and you want us to run to you, and, and you throw your arms wide to us, and say, come to me, and you'll find grace to help in times of need. May we find that, and we trust you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And all God's people said, amen. God bless you.